Tony will be preaching on Revelation 3.1, and the, he will not preach on the whole uh, section of this, because I believe Brother Gene has part of this um, scripture as well. But the portion that he has to offer is, He that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So when I looked at uh, the scripture that Brother Tony was going to be preaching on, immediately I thought about the completeness of Christ. This number seven just, just stuck with me of how complete Christ is in all the things that he does. And that he's full of the Spirit. Spirit. The, the Spirit dwells fully in Christ. He's the only one who has ever been able to have the, whole, the full Spirit of God in him. So um, he also, he hath the churches. He has everything. So, so Christ has everything in his hands. So look at how complete this is, this work that he's doing Amen. now. So um, this reminded me that Christ is the one that's building his church. It's not anyone else. There's no man that can do this. So we've been looking at Jesus, and he's the one that's doing this work. He's the one who began it, and he is the one that will finish it. And so because of this, then he will finish the work that he has began in you. So this is something that you can be assured of as we're uh, in this preaching festival this weekend, that you can be comforted in your hearts and minds that, that Jesus will complete this work that he has in you and he will bring you all the way to glory. And like has already been brought out, he is always with us. So now let's listen to what the Spirit has to say to this church that's meeting together this weekend as Brother Tony preaches. Now, I've seen Brother Aaron balance his Bible up there. Let's see if I can do that, too. <laughs> There's another song they sang. I'm not going to sing it, but they sang it. Just to, he, ha he has a whole world in his hands. Remember singing that one? It's a whole world in his hands. Right now, though, we see Jesus. He has the seven spirits of God in one hand, and he has the seven stars. You know, so he, he has those in his hands this evening. Of course, he has the whole world too, but you can see the world is not really the emphasis that we're looking at right now. We're looking at uh, things that pertain to what he's doing in particular. Now, there's in his whole book of, re, of, of the Revelation, there's an infinite number of things that we can see and, and things to reach out for, the things that are of interest to the people of God. Just in our assignments this weekend, the implications of Christ confronting uh, the people of God and, and, uh, and Christ being found abiding in the midst of the church, looking at these things is both joyful and they're, and they're fearful too. You know that Christ is, is there and, and God has spoken to man. We know that. You see, he's speaking. However, <clears throat> what's not so evident is that he is still speaking, as Brother Aaron said. He's speaking to us tonight. He's speaking, he's speaking on the inside of us where it counts. In my text of Scripture, Christ is communicating to the people of God. The message that he delivered, de delivers is just as fresh and just as potent as it was the day he left his mouth. The word of God will never stop working until it does what God wants done. Amen. Until it has satisfied God, it won't stop. Jesus speaks to us. What a wonderful thing, yeah. you see? Jesus speaks to us, and the words he speaks are life. And men, we need life. And so well, uh, I thought to myself now, we know that it, how, how does Jesus speak? I want to just use this and, and, and just sort of kind of ease into our text. What about the manner or the style of his speaking? How does Jesus speak? Now we have recorded, like we've already heard tonight, that men came back and said, no man ever spake like this man. You know, and, and <clears throat> but we don't, we only have one account though in the scriptures that give us any idea the way he sounded when he spoke and the manner in which his words were delivered, how he delivered his words. In his hometown, this is what they said, and they all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. The idea is that the words just flowed out of the mouth of Christ when he spoke. Peter said, we've all tasted uh, of his graciousness. So then it does not surprise us to hear uh, <clears throat> that uh, Jesus speaks with a tone that's full of grace. Those, some words may be hard to hear. <clears throat> Christ speaks them with grace so that the tender heart is cheered and delighted. Jesus never spoke to the brethren out of the flesh, really. How could, Jesus was not in the flesh. He couldn't speak out of it. He didn't speak sharp and mean. He, he spoke soft 
to the saints of God. He was hard on sin and sinners, okay? He was easy on the saints, tough on sin and hypocrisy and things of this nature. You remember how he dealt with that? He spoke not, uh, he's talking easy to the saints of God. That's the way we are to the saints of God. We know who they are. You know, in this way, I think Jacob was a lot like Christ. He said, go ahead, my brother. He said, go ahead. My Lord knoweth that the children are tender and the flocks and the herds with young are with men. If, I should, if men should drive them one day, all the flock could die. And I would lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure. You can say what you want to. The Lord doesn't drive his people. Now, I, point, I want you to see that Christ is standing in the midst of the churches tonight. This is how he's standing. Oh, Lord. <clears throat> The little bit of leading I do, let me lead softly. The sheep don't scatter when the shepherd enters the fold. They get up and they, they gather to him as he gently calls. In our scripture, I want you to see this exactly what the Lord is doing right here in my text. Jesus introduces himself in a way which uniquely qualifies him to do this kind of work because like it's already been pointed out at the first beginning, he is the chief shepherd. You already know that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. It unveils the central person of all scripture. All the symbols point to him, and they find their meaning in him. It's all about him. In the Gospels, where Jesus, where we read where Jesus is in his humble state, it's in the Gospels there, where he volunteered and laid his privileges down as deity, but, uh, <clears throat> and also in the Gospels where we see how man treated him. But now in this book of the Revelation, we get to see how heaven regards the man Christ Jesus. There's no humility here, brethren. No humbling of Christ here. Jesus is in his most exalted state. We see him not the way he be, will be one day. This is the way he is now, today. And it's how Christ, and it is how Christ is ministering to the churches in his exalted state. We believe what Peter said? Absolutely. God raised him up and God exalted him. That's how he is now. That's when we see him in Revelation. <clears throat> the Apostle John does his best to describe Jesus in, in the first chapter in his exalted state. John said, I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. Jesus is not out and about ministering, ministering in all the regions of the earth. You notice in this scripture here. He's already done this. You see where Jesus is at at this time. Jesus is now focused on all those who have believed the report. Those who have received the testimony handed down to them by the apostles. And in my text, this happens to be the, uh, the brethren at Sardis. Jesus is working among many brethren. He's bringing many sons unto glory. That's why he's a captain of our salvation. Amen. As far as heaven is concerned, brethren, you can see the important ones are those who belong to Jesus. That's where he's spending his time. Mm -hmm. Right now, our status on the earth, brethren, is we're the tail. Here on the earth, we're not regarded as anything. But one day it will be seen what our true status really was. Just as the Lord came as a servant of men, as true identity was hid by the flesh, so it is with us. Our true identity is hid. Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not might see. He came to those who were blind but, but desired to see. They, got, they were the ones that got their sight. And those who already thought they saw had no desire to see. They were made blind. This is what Jesus came to do. Jesus did these things for the Father. The Father wanted these things done. He wanted the world reconciled. And it, all these things, like Brother Aaron said, when he took captivity captive, you see, he, he got the whole shebang, as, as, as the world says. But I wanted, to, I wanted to say this, that to reconcile the world to God and destroy the works of the devil, and remove sin, to set the captives free. These things were done for the Father. All these things were done in order to get at the people of God. Amen. You see, free the people of God was the primary focus, primary purpose. Everything else was extra, you see. When he set the people of God free, Christ set the whole world free. 
I was compelled to say all of this because I'm not surprised to read that Jesus is still in the midst of the people of God. He's set free. He said before he left, that's where you find him. Jesus has always been in the midst of the people of God. When his ministry started at Jordan River, it was John the Baptist who baptized him. And he promptly surrounded himself with the man God gave him. He went about preaching and teaching the kingdom of God with many signs and miracles, the scripture said. But he did it all while in the circumference and the company and the confines of the 12 disciples. He moved about the regions of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria in the midst of the 12. He did this. And the other disciples followed him. Now Jesus is about to speak to those at Sardis. Now I envision Christ is standing. That's why I see Christ standing. And, and with arms and hands outstretched. That's why I see him in my mind. In one hand he has the seven spirits of God. And in the other he has the seven stars. And he says, I know thy works. How is it that Jesus can address the brethren this way? Because he's the mediator. <laughs> That's why. He, this is his sole purpose, his sole, the word slips in mind, this is his sole job, okay? And this is the work of a mediator to do what he's interceding to God on behalf of his brother. Jesus walks among the churches as a prophet, priest, and king, interceding for those God has given him. God give them to him. The apostle John says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus is our advocate, rightly so. But he's, medi he's doing this as a mediator. He's interceding for us as a mediator. As he exercises and discharges this function, his mediatorial powers, he does so in the character of a prophet, priest, and king. I know I didn't pronounce that word right. Just overlook that, brother. How does, how does our Lord mediate? Now, Peter knew the Lord personally. Okay, so he could speak to this. Yeah, amen. He describes the Lord as a shepherd. Speaking of the way the Lord is among the brethren, he's a shepherd. We're the sheep. Peter never forgot what Christ told him. I'm the good shepherd. Jesus will walk among the churches, brethren, as a shepherd among his own flock. You've got to see this. Amen. Peter said it's a chief shepherd. The chief shepherd among his, his sheep. They belong to him. He leaves with the heart of a shepherd. He doesn't walk among the people of God as a hard master, expecting to reap and gather where it's not labored. The intercession that the Lord is doing is a kind which says, I will not quench a smoldering flax, and a bruised reed I shall not break. The same Jesus who cursed a fig tree and in his zeal for the Father drove out the merchants, Matthew says he's a king of glory. The Lord of glory, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. This is the same Lord. Yet, yeah, he's a chief shepherd for the people of God, interceding in behalf of us. He will not fail nor be discouraged, brethren. Amen. He will not faint, and he will not himself be crushed. Amen. And of those the Father has given him, he'll lose none. He'll lose none. Well, that's the word we believe. And we hang on to in this dying and dead world. He will lose none. While we inhabit his wretched flesh, Christ is our hope. Because he will lose not a one of us. The seven spirits of God are in Jesus' hand. Now Isaiah had something to say about this, believe it or not. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him quick understanding and the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Isaiah is, Isaiah is, is speaking of this one, whose judgments are faithful, and right, he that hath the seven stars of, of, of God in his hand and the seven spirits. Now, we understand that he has these things, you see. He, he, he possesses them. That means that he, he has ownership, so to speak. He has control of them. They're in his hand. Now, these seven spirits, by the way, they are the same seven spirits that are seen earlier before the throne of God in Revelation 1-4. Okay? But now, these seven spirits are in the hand of the Lord. 
makes me think that the Lord has oversight of, over them, you yeah. see. Now, you notice that this letter is said to have come from the one in, one, in, in Revelation 1, 4. It says, uh, which, it comes from the one which is, which was, and which is to come. And also, this letter also comes from the seven spirits of God. So they've joined together. And the, you already know that the number seven means in Scripture. You know what the, the number seven already means. You probably know more about this than I do. I can't tell you what seven means in relation to the seven spirits or the seven stars concisely and absolutely. I can tell you, though, there are 19 separate things that are portrayed in groups of seven in Revelation. A bunch of them. I'm not going to read them, but there's things like seven kings, seven mountains, seven bowls, seven plagues, seven angels, seven crowns, seven heads, and it goes on. There's a lot of seven groups besides the seven spirits of God. And there are also numerous multiples of seven throughout the book. There are other numbers that stand out as prominent as well in Revelation. But we don't let these numbers and these symbols distract from the core message of what we're looking at. No one can tell us with absolute, no one can tell us with absolute certainty why the number seven appears so much throughout the scripture or in Revelation. Seven has always been regarded, though, to represent fullness and completion. We know that God rested on the seventh day from all his work, and he blessed the day and made it holy. And for that reason, the number seven is a blessed number, and it's a holy number. Now, now considering the environment that we live in, I'm talking about a, 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 a religion that's dominated by man or a man's dominated religion, we need just to, to just affirm positively tonight that all of salvation belongs to God in Christ Jesus. That's, that's really what we're talking about tonight as we discuss the very aspects. Men just need to back off and get out of the way. Jesus has got this. Jesus has got this. He's got it and he's showing us right here. He's in possession of the seven spirits of God. All the vitality, all the vitality of God is characterized in the spirit, in the spirit of God. All the get up and go and, and all the get it done that God does is, is characterized by the spirit moving among men. How will God set up his kingdom on earth? How will the son of righteousness conquer sin, death, and Satan? Not in great power and fleshly might. Zechariah says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. David said uh, in reference to the spirit of God. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You see what I'm saying? Jesus has got this in his hand. Jesus returned to Galilee after 40 days in the wilderness temptation in the power of the Spirit. He had it then. In Hebrews, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace. No grace without the Spirit of God. You short on grace, try walking in the Spirit. Amen. Our sanctification is the will of God. Glory. Through sanctification of the Spirit, you hear the Spirit. Amen. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Yes. The words I speak, they are Spirit and they are life, Christ said. The Spirit giveth life. Trying to just demonstrate that the Lord is holding all these things in his hand when he holds the seven spirits of God. <clears throat> what do I see when I look at the hand, what the Lord is holding in his hands? Well, it's enough for me to see he is absolutely in control. Okay? Amen. And something else. We understand that Jesus is not in some distant place, far removed from his, his people. And he, in heaven on the right hand of God cannot mean he's far away. He's standing before the church with outstretched arms. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Doesn't, mean that Je doesn't that mean that Jesus is close by? Well, it does. And here Jesus is close enough to know every detail concerning the health and the well-being of his church. He is not detached, brother, and standing off aloof somewhere. In a time of need, we are told to come because Jesus is touched by our feelings of uh, our weaknesses, the feelings of our infirmities. And the mercy is we don't have to go very far, you see. But get this. Revelation 120 tells us that the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. We don't have to guess about this. He has in one hand seven stars and the other 
the seven angels of the churches. You need to know, brethren, that the that angel, the word angel is the English equivalent, letter for letter, of the Greek word that means messenger or envoy. You can make up your own mind whether the messengers are angelic beings or not. It's, that's up to you. I think the important thing to consider, God has a message to the churches. And he has created a place for messengers. Marvelous consideration. He has angelic messengers who are ministering spirits into the uh, uh, those who are appointed for salvation. He, he has also appointed men as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There are, there are those who teach and exhort, edify the church of God by a message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see that the messenger of God, that the messengers of God and the message acts, actually, you see, but they're in the Lord's hand, you see. Amen. Concerning the message that the messengers are to bring, Jesus only spoke. Okay, himself now, he, he, he's only, he, he, he himself spoke only the words the Father gave him to say. Amen. Over and over and over, multiple times, John makes this point, record that Jesus only spoke what was given him to say, and his testimony is true, he said. If any man will do his will, he shall know of this doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That means no one can accuse Jesus of having a purpose that was different from what the Father intended. Amen. Although Jesus could have, he could have done this, but he never added or he never took away from the message. He didn't venture out and give his own word. He was, he was careful to say that he spoke only what the Father gave him to say. Believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Question. The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Now, this mentioned that Jesus brought from the Father, it became the message of the apostles. That's what I'm trying to say. And through them, it became the message of the brethren, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a message from God. We know it's his word because it comes with power. In Jesus' hand are those who handle the message of God. They're in his hand. In other words, Jesus knows who they are. They belong to Jesus. They're in his hand. You could say that the hand of God is upon them if you wanted to. They're under the leadership and direction of the hand of God. That means there's no deviation from the message of God. The message that comes from God, there's not, you see. Because the messengers are hand-picked, they're in his hand. We have messengers professing to be from God who have a message that emphasizes life on this earth. <clears throat> when the message Jesus speaks, the message he brought speaks only of the world to come, the kingdom of God to come. Some have a message that divides and separates the people of God and allows them to ponder and dwell on earthly pursuits. When Christ came, his message was to gather the people of God to himself and focus their attention on the kingdom of God to come. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel. Yeah. We're talking about the message, that it will do the things it was sent to do. Heal the brokenhearted, deliver the captives, recover the blind, set at liberty. If the message men are preaching aren't doing these things, we should be very skeptical. The messengers of Christ are the ones that he sends. They're in his hand and they're under his control. Someone posted it the other day. I read, I don't need someone to get up and tell me all that's wrong with me. I just need to hear about the one who can make it right. Just tell me about provisions that will do that. I chuckled to myself. I did. I chuckled to myself and I thought, tell me about it. Someone trying to tell me what's wrong with me, they don't know the half of it. You see? <laughs> he has messengers in his hand. And they're ready be, to be sent. And this is not something new, brother. God has been doing this from day one. Sending men. Sending messengers. Plenty early. Talking to mankind. Jesus Christ is ministering to his church. Through the Holy Spirit in one hand and by his messengers in the other. That the number seven is seen in the Lord's hands means that they're all there. Every, everything's there. Amen. Right? That the, it, in closing, my closing thoughts, we are seeing Christ as a central figure, and he's been given full and complete oversight of the church. What else does he need? When he, he, said, he has the means at his disposal to give all that is needed. 
Now, I want to go back to a statement I made earlier. The grace of God is dispensed to us. The grace of God that we need and depend upon come from the hand of the Lord. Since it's delivered by the means of the spirit of grace, and we see that the seven spirits of, uh, of God are in his hand, the messengers of God are in his other hand. <clears throat> let, our, let our messages help one another walk in the spirit where there is grace to live in joy, peace, and all righteousness. I want my messages to work in that way so that it would enable the brethren to walk in the spirit so that all the good things of the Lord are there in the spirit of God. Thank you, brethren.